In this lecture, we're going to be covering chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the Medical Law and Ethics textbook. Chapter 1 defines medical law. Medical law addresses legal rights and obligations that affect patients and protect individual rights, including rights of health care employees. It provides a yardstick to measure or judge one's actions, and it punishes unlawful actions. Laws are rules or actions prescribed by a government authority that have a binding legal force. Under the Medical Practice Acts, it regulates how medicine is practiced in each state. The Act provides a legal definition for the practice of medicine in each particular state. It lists requirements and methods for licensure and it defines what constitutes unprofessional conduct. Ethics is a branch of philosophy related to morals, moral principles, and moral judgment. Morality is being virtuous, practicing right conduct. It uses reason and logic to analyze problems and find solutions. Ethics is concerned with actions and practices that improve the welfare of people in a moral way. Medical ethics concerns issues related to the practice of medicine. It explores and promotes principles guiding one's conduct as a health care professional. It involves the welfare and consideration of others in deciding how to act. One type of ethics is utilitarianism. It states that the greatest good for the greatest number of people is the most ethical approach. The impact of actions on the welfare of society as a whole rather than merely the impact on the individual. In other words, the ends justify the means. An example of this approach can be seen in the Medicare system. Some weaknesses in this type of approach to ethics would be the rights of some people, such as the poor or the ill, may be ignored. It can result in biased allocations of resources. It's virtually impossible to quantify all the variables. And the vulnerable, such as the young, sick, or handicapped, may be ignored. The rights-based ethics approach emphasizes the individual's rights. Rights belong to all people. Some of the weaknesses of this approach is that it may result in individualist or selfish behavior, even anarchy. The duty-based ethics approach focuses on performing one's duty. It explores conflicting opinions about one's duty. It differs depending on one's professional role. For example, a registered nurse, a physician assistant, and a medical assistant are going to have different duties. Weaknesses of this approach include a difficulty to know who determines one's duty. Justice-based ethics 
is based on a veil of ignorance which allows the decision maker to be impartial in their decision making. Some weaknesses to this approach is that it's unfair for the health or the healthy to subsidize the unhealthy. And due to media coverage in huge healthcare system, it is impossible to have the veil of ignorance, which is essential to this model of ethics. Virtue-based ethics, this has an emphasis on people, not on decisions or the principles involved. It's based on character traits such as one's integrity. Virtues are good habits. Examples would be fairness, honesty, courage, and justice. Weaknesses of this approach, a person may become too trusting and complacent. Values that drive ethical behavior are beneficence, empathy, fidelity, gentleness, holistic, humility, justice, perseverance, responsibility, sanctity of life, tolerance, and work. Interpersonal ethics looks to things like respect, integrity, honesty, fairness, empathy, sympathy, compassion, and loyalty. Workplace issues, privacy or confidentiality, due process in the workplace, and sexual harassment in the workplace. Also, understanding one's comparable worth. The three-step ethics model asks three questions. First, is it legal? If so, is it balanced? For example, does one person or group benefit or suffer more than another as a result of your actions? Third, how does it make me feel? Embarrassed or proud? The seven-step model for examining ethical dilemmas. First, determine the facts. Next, define the precise ethical issue. Third, identify the major principles, rules, and values. Then, specify the alternatives. Fifth, compare the values and alternatives. Then, assess the consequences before you make a decision. Dr. Bernard Lowe's clinical model. First, you gather information. Then, you clarify the ethical issues before you resolve the dilemma. Ethics is not just about how you feel. It's not about sincerity of beliefs. It's not about emotional responses. And it's not only about one's religious beliefs. Bioethics concerns moral dilemmas and issues resulting from advanced medicine and medical research relating to life. Examples would include cloning, stem cell research, and gene therapy. Bioethicists specialize in the field of bioethics. An ethics committee examines ethical issues relating to patient care. It contains a variety of members from many healthcare disciplines. It can serve in an advisory capacity to patients, families, and staff for case review of difficult ethical issues. It can develop and review health policies 
and guidelines regarding ethical issues. Quality assurance is where one gathers and evaluates information about services, examines the results, and compares information against the standard of care. Medical etiquette, certain rules or standards of professional behavior that physicians practice in their relationships or conduct with other physicians. For example, telephone calls from one doctor to another should be taken promptly. That concludes chapter one. Chapter two deals with the legal system. Two fundamental processes. The federal system, power is divided between the central government, the federal government, and the local government or the smaller government, which are state governments. Checks and balances are designed so that no one single branch of government can control the entire government. Also, it means each branch of the government is scrutinized by the other branches. The legal system in the United States Constitution, there are three branches of government. The legislative branch, which entails the Senate and House of Representatives. On the state level, it's referred to as the legislature. Uh, the federal level, it's referred to as Congress. Uh, it is the lawmaking body. The executive branch includes the president, the cabinet and advisors, and the enforcement of law. That's on the federal level. On the state level, we have the governor and the governor's advisors, agencies, including law enforcement agencies. The judicial branch includes judges, state and federal courts, which interprets the law and answers questions of law. Sources of law include constitutional law, which addresses the relationship between individuals and their government, and statutory and regulatory law, which is passed by legislative bodies, either Congress or the legislature of a state. Common law or case law is established from court decisions. It's based on precedent, old case decisions still influence today's healthcare professionals. Classification of laws, public classification would include criminal, administrative, constitutional, and international. Private or civil classification includes torts, contracts, property law, inheritance, which includes wills, estates, and trust, family law, and corporate law. Civil or private law concerns relationships between individuals or between individuals, businesses, and government. Normally, one party, if they're successful, is awarded monetary damages. This includes tort law and contract law. Tort law is a civil injury or a wrongful act committed against another person or property that results in harm or damages. This is normally compensated by monetary damages. A tort can be intentional or unintentional. Intentional torts include assault, which is the threat of bodily harm, battery, which is actual bodily harm, false imprisonment, 
which is the violation of one's liberty and defamation of character, which can either be slander or libel. Intentional torts also include fraud, such as embezzlement, deceitful practices, invasion of privacy, such as a break in confidentiality. Unintentional torts usually arise out of negligence, which is an unintentional action that occurs when a person either performs or fails to perform an action that a reasonable person would or would not have committed in a similar situation. It involves performing carefully or carelessly or failing to perform a task, not exercising ordinary standard of care can result in a negligent tort. Contract law addresses a breach or neglect of legally binding agreements between two parties. A contract is a voluntary agreement between two parties with the intent of benefiting each other. Something of value, known as consideration, has to be part of the agreement in order for there to be a contract. Both parties also must be competent to enter into a contract. Expressed contracts are agreements entered into orally or in writing. All components of the contract must be clearly stated, whereas an implied contract is an agreement that is shown through inferences by signs, inaction, or silence. In other words, the court is going to look at the behavior of the parties to see if they acted in a way that would imply a contractual relationship. Abandonment is withdrawing medical care from a patient without providing sufficient notice. Breach of contract is where either party fails to comply with the terms of the agreement. Withdrawing medical care from a patient without providing sufficient notice in writing could lead to a breach of a medical contract. Class action lawsuits are filed by one or more people on behalf of a larger group of people. The members of the group are all affected by the same situation. Criminal law protects the public from harmful acts of others. It defines socially intolerable conduct that is punishable by law. The government prosecutes those who violate the law. Penalties can include a fine, imprisonment, or both. A crime may be a felony or a misdemeanor. A misdemeanor is a crime that carries up to one year in the county jail. A felony is a crime that carries a year or more in the state penitentiary or in a federal bureau of prisons. Administrative law regulations set by government agencies, which include licensing and supervision of prescribing controlled substances, health department regulations, regulations against homicide, infant side, euthanasia, assault, and battery, regulations against fraud. The court systems, there are two court systems in the United States, a state system and a federal system. Each court has specific responsibilities. Some courts have exclusive jurisdiction over a particular type of subject matter, such as a chancery court would have jurisdiction over 
divorce proceedings other types of cases courts may have concurrent jurisdiction and this is where a case can be heard in either of those courts so some type of property case could be brought either in circuit court or in chancery court the federal courts consist of the district courts the court of appeals and the United States Supreme Court the states have circuit courts chancery courts then the Mississippi State Court of Appeals and the Mississippi Supreme Court the trial process starts with the jury pool the clerk of the court will send out jury summons people will respond to those summons and that will create your pool of potential jurors then the judge and the parties to the lawsuit either the prosecutor and the defendant or the plaintiff and the defendant will conduct void dire which is a question and answer session held by the prosecutor plaintiff the defense and the judge with the potential jury pool after void dire a jury is picked and the jury will hear the case the case starts with opening statements then the plaintiff or the prosecutor has to put on its case and prove its case then the defense will put on its case closing arguments and then a verdict will be reached in a criminal case the case first will go before a grand jury the grand jury will hear only from the prosecution and make a probable cause determination as to whether or not the defendant committed the crime if the jury decides that it's more likely than not that the defendant committed the crime the grand jury will issue a true bill which renders an indictment if the jury does not believe that the defendant more likely than not committed the crime no true bill will be entered and the case is dismissed once an indictment is entered it's served on the defendant and the case is put on the trial docket litigation may result when two parties are unable to resolve their legal dispute themselves the plaintiff is the person who brings an action into civil litigation the defendant is the person or institution that's being sued oftentimes civil cases will settle out of court that's when both sides can reach an agreement without having to submit it to a jury at trial in a civil case if either side is not happy with the outcome at trial then the case can be appealed in a criminal case only the defendant has the right to appeal if he is convicted if the jury acquits the defendant in a criminal case the prosecution cannot appeal that decision in a civil case the defense prior to trial will move for summary judgment and this is a request made by the defense attorney asking the judge to rule as a matter of law that there is no case that can be presented to a jury in order to conduct discovery subpoenas are issued a subpoena can be issued for the 
taking of a deposition, which is an out-of-court sworn uh, session where questions are asked by the attorney and a person has to answer just as if they were in court. Subpoenas can be issued for people to appear at trial. These are called trial subpoenas where a person has to come to court and testify under oath. If the attorneys are trying to obtain documentation, they will issue a subpoena ducas tecum, which is a court order requiring a third party to either produce records or bring the records to court and explain to the judge why they should not be produced. There are several different levels of proof. In a civil case, the plaintiff has to prove their case by a preponderance of the evidence. This is just a tipping of the scales in the plaintiff's favor. So once the plaintiff is able to show their case by 51%, then they have met their burden of proof and the jury is going to be instructed to find in favor of the plaintiff. In criminal cases, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the highest burden and the prosecution has to meet each element of their case beyond a reasonable doubt before a jury can convict. Oftentimes in litigation, both criminal and civil, expert witnesses are called. An expert witness is a professional who has special knowledge or experience and they are recognized and qualified as an expert by the judge. Their testimony is given to assist the judge and jury in determining the facts or accuracy of the facts in the case. In medical cases, expert witnesses often testify as to what the standard of care is. They are paid for their services. They're paid for rendering an expert opinion. Oftentimes, they clarify points of knowledge not readily understood by the jury or the judge. If you testify in court, you're taking an oath to tell the truth. You must tell the truth or run the risk of being charged with perjury, which is a felony and carries 10 years in prison. You should be professional, remain calm, do not answer a question that you do not understand. Present only the facts that you, you know yourself. You should never try to memorize testimony. Just tell the truth and testify as to what you know, not what someone else knows. Chapter 3 discusses the essentials of the legal system for healthcare professionals. The Medical Practice Acts establish examining boards, provide a baseline for the practice of medicine, determine prerequisites for licensure, forbid practice of medicine without a license. The Act specify conditions for renewal, suspension, and revocations of a license. And these specifications are going to vary from state to state. The licensure of a physician, there's an examination by the National Board of Medical Examiners. The uh, examination is referred to as the National Board of Medical Examination or NBME. There is the Federal Licensing Examination or FLEX and the U U.S. Medical Licensing Examination or USMLE. An endorsement is a way a physician can obtain a license. An endorsement is an approval or a sanction. Reciprocity is cooperation of one state in granting a license to practice medicine to a physician already licensed in another state. 
registration is required for a license. This occurs annually or biannually. Physicians must pay a fee. Physicians are required to complete 75 hours of continuing medical education in a three-year period. When a valid license is not needed by a physician, this is when a physician is employed by a federal medical facility. But keep in mind that a licensed physician to practice medicine must be had in some state. So a state license is still going to be required, even if you practice in a federal medical facility. You do not need a license if you're rendering aid in an emergency or while establishing residency or when a doctor is engaged solely in research. Revocation and suspension occurs when there is unprofessional conduct, such as falsifying records, gross immorality, the commission of a crime, such as Medicare or Medicaid fraud, rape, murder, larceny, or a narcotics conviction. It can also occur if a physician is incapacitated, either a physical or mental incapacity. Licensure and certification of allied health professionals. In order to obtain a license, you must graduate from an accredited school and pass the national exam of competency. Certification is where one meets standards set by the accreditation body and pass a national exam of competency. Accreditation consists of a voluntary request of official review by accrediting agency, which examines the policy and procedures of the agency, must demonstrate that the institution maintains high standards. When we talk about the standard of care, ordinary skill and care must be used by medical practitioners. It must provide the same knowledge, care, and skill that similarly trained physicians and or medical professionals would provide under the same or similar circumstances. Perform as reasonable and prudent person would perform. Physicians are not obligated to treat everyone in case of emergency. They are expected to use reasonable, ordinary skill and care, not extraordinary. They are expected to exhaust all resources available to them for patient care. They are not to expose patients to undue risk. The prudent person rule, also called the reasonable person standard, must provide the following information to the patient, diagnosis, risk and consequences of treatment, expected benefits of treatment, or of the procedure. You must provide the following information to the patient, alternative treatments, prognosis, if no treatment, cost and expected pain, and you must follow the acceptable standard of care. Confidentiality is keeping private all information about a patient. You cannot disclose anything without written consent. The Medical Patient Rights Act is a federal law that gives all patients the right to have privacy respected and records held confidential. The statute of limitations is a period of time a patient has to file a lawsuit. This time period is usually one to three years. If they fail to file their lawsuit within the statute of limitations, they are barred from filing the lawsuit. Discovery rule begins when a problem is discovered or when the patient should have known of the injury. Good faith belief is a defense to a lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. We'll come down and greet counsel and then proceed to our next case.
Good Samaritan laws are state laws that help protect health care professionals and ordinary citizens from liability while giving care in an emergency situation. No one is required to provide aid except if you live in the state of Vermont. The only required to act within limits of acquired skill and training. However, once you start, you must continue until help arrives or you are physically unable to continue. The doctrine of respondeat superior states, let the master answer. In other words, an employer is liable for the acts of its employee within the scope of that employee's employment. The employee has a duty to carry out orders, the duty to interpret and carry out orders, the duty to clarify ambiguous or erroneous orders, and the duty to decline orders that appear dangerous for the patient and the requirement to notify the physician. Scope of practice, you must understand and work within the scope of practice for your discipline, you must understand and practice within the guidelines of the profession, you must understand and follow the chain of command so no employee makes a decision he or she is unqualified to make. Employer's duty to employees, responsibility to provide safe environment for employees and staff. Employer must have liability insurance to cover accidents and unforeseen incidents. The employer may bond employees who handle money. And some have liability insurance for auto if used for work-related business. Risk of management is the practice used to control or minimize incidences of problem behavior that might result in injury to patients and or employees or liability for the physician employer. Risk management identifies the risk, behaviors, and practices, develops and follows plans of action to eliminate problem behavior, and addresses corrective actions in policy and procedure books and employee handouts. An incident report is the documenting of problem areas. It should be used for all unusual occurrences including falls, errors in dispensing medication, needle sticks, or any patient or employee complaint. This concludes uh, the lecture on chapters one through three.